Now, when we talk about peripheral resistance, uh, it can be uh, understood in two ways. Two formulas which you have uh, learned in your 10th standard or maybe even earlier with the present syllabus is applying Ohm's law and applying the Hagen Poiseuille's law. The next determinant is peripheral resistance. Uh, you have, uh, you are aware that uh, cardiac output is nothing but uh, stroke volume into uh, the heart rate, and the heart rate is uh, uh, variable um, for a fixed to maintain a fixed output. The amount of volume pumped in each beat multiplied by the heart rate gives you the um, cardiac output. Now, stroke volume is. Um, a function of both the volume in the heart as well as uh, the how much the blood uh, the vasculature can accept. The heart rate is obviously a, a variable uh, on its own. Now, when we talk about peripheral resistance, uh, it can be uh, understood in two ways. Two formulas which you have uh, learned in your 10th standard or maybe even earlier with the present syllabus is applying Ohm's law and applying the Hagen Poiseuille's law. So, these are pretty straightforward things where you have. Uh, in physics, we learn that the voltage is nothing but uh, the flow of current into the resistance. So, resistance is nothing but uh, the gradient uh, by the flow. I am trying to gently convert physics into uh, cardiovascular hemodynamic concepts. So, the resistance is nothing but the peripheral vascular resistance or the in this case the systemic vascular resistance and the gradient is nothing but the pressure gradient which can be written as delta P. And the blood flow is nothing but instead of I, we write it as Q. So, in other words, the systemic vascular resistance is proportional to the pressure gradient and inversely proportional to the flow. So, peripheral resistance is the pressure across the vascular bed divided by the blood flow across the same bed. Again, pressure gradient is inversely proportional with the fourth power of radius. This again can be a MCQ if they ask you cubed of the radius or squared of the radius or proportion to the radius. This is nothing but the Hagen Poiseuille's law. It is also called the Poiseuille's law, where we know that uh, the uh, pressure gradient is proportional to when any fluid has to flow across a tube, not necessarily an elastic tube, even a fixed tube. It is proportional to the length of the tube. It is proportional to the viscosity of the fluid. Um, it is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the radius. In other words, if we compare the iota and the branch of the iota, for example, a renal artery, and if the renal artery is stenosed, compared to a patient who has a normal renal artery. The difference in the radius uh, actually changes the uh, pressure gradient by its fourth power. So, it is very uh, critical and it uh, changes a lot when there is even mild stenosis. So, pressure gradients uh, vary by the fourth power of the radius according to the Poiseuille's law. In arteriosclerosis, the main uh, change is that there is an elevation in systolic blood pressure and the pulse pressure widens. It is nothing but stiffening of the vessels, diastolic pressure may remain the same, systolic pressure disproportionately goes up. People can have either isolated systolic hypertension or um, combined hypertension with significantly elevated systolic values often seen in the elderly. Uh, when we talk about the uh, vessels involved, the most important vessels causing hypertension are usually small arteries of the dimension 10 to 400 microns or 0.1 to 0.4 millimeter in luminal diameter and less than 100 microns are the arterioles. So, arterioles and small arteries both are uh, responsible for developing peripheral resistance of hypertension. Then coming to vascular remodeling, this is an important concept that uh, uh, definitely could be a potential question because it is there in both Harrison's and Braunwald. Uh, a little more detail is mentioned in Braunwald's. So, hypertensive remodeling. When we are talking about remodeling, what comes to your mind first is always cardiac remodeling because we talk about it in diastolic dysfunction, in hypertensive heart disease and we see that the LV uh, remodels either after a myocardial infarction or due to sustained uh, afterload in the case of aortic stenosis or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or the sustained hypertension or coactation of aorta. So, and so forth. But here we are talking about the remodeling of the vessels and the classic feature of remodeling in hypertension is that there is increased media to lumen ratio. That is if there is a vessel like this and if the normal vessel has media of this thickness, what happens is uh, you measure the amount of media that is there in this part and you measure the lumen that is there in this part. 
what happens as a effect of um, hypertension is that there is increased media at the end proportionally. It can happen in two ways. If it is a hypertrophic remodeling, then it expands both outwards and inwards and this vessel which was initially like this would become having a smaller lumen and developing significant hypertrophy. Now, what we notice here, two things have happened. The lumen has become smaller. The entire size of the vessel has become larger. A smaller vessel has become now larger. So, it has expanded both inwardly and outwardly. This is because of hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is where smooth muscle cells and the, fib um, the matrix also increase in their size, though there is no significant uh, cell division. Now, because of increased cell size and matrix, the vessel becomes larger. It is um, uh, increase in the size of the vessel uh, at the cost of both the lumen as well as external expansion. This is often seen in large arteries large arteries meaning branches of the iota and large muscular vessels. <clears throat> it is a hallmark of isolated systolic hypertension. I will summarize this at the end where it will become more clear to you how important this can be asked as MCQs. Again in eutrophic or inward, it is less often called inward, it is more often called eutrophic remodeling. So eutrophic means the same material amount meaning there is no actual increase in the media but there is only compromise of the lumen. What happens is the same vessel, considering the same vessel first, what happens in eutrophic or inward modeling is the lumen gets compromised, but only the lumen gets compromised. There is no significant increase in the um, outer dimension of the vessel because the same amount of smooth muscle cells, they have not undergone any hypertrophy. They just reorganize better such that now the new vessel is a little smaller than it once was, but the lumen is much smaller than it earlier was. So, in other words, it is almost as if the cells have all shifted into a smaller concentric circle such that the media has increased, but at the cost of the lumen. So, both these uh, forms of hypertrophy follow this law that there is increased media to lumen ratio, but not necessarily increased media in absolute terms. Increased media in absolute terms happens only in the hypertrophic form. In eutrophic form, the total media remains the same, but the lumen becomes smaller such that the vessel size itself becomes smaller. And uh, the common factor between both these is that both, them, both of them develop a smaller lumen. So, in hypertensive remodeling due to either form, if it expands both inwards and outwards and causes a small lumen, it is hypertrophic. If it expands only inwards and forms a smaller lumen, and but without ex expanding externally, it is called eutrophic. That is called inward. Uh, MCQ wise, what is important is they can ask you this question. One, hypertrophic remodeling is associated with isolated systolic hypertension, whereas eutrophic remodeling is associated with diastolic hypertension. This is one clear cut um, possible MCQ. There is actually, it is only described in Harrison in Brownwell other than the figure. It is also, uh, there is a diagram on the top right uh, side of the page and it is also clearly described what I have tried to draw and uh, explain to you here. So, hypertrophic correlates with systolic hypertension, eutrophic correlates with diastolic hypertension is one. Second, hypertrophic, there is absolute hyper, actual hypertrophy of the media, whereas here there is the same material amount. Um, there is no change in the size of the smooth muscle cells. It is only, the only change is the organization of the smooth muscle cells in a smaller circle around a smaller lumen. So, the smooth muscle cells do not undergo any hypertrophy, they just organize around a smaller lumen, they reorganize themselves. It is like a, a group dance where you know the concentric circle of people come into a smaller circle, that is all that happens. So, they are closely packed into a smaller size, but they are not hypertrophied. Uh, but the common thing is that both of them have an increased media to lumen ratio, meaning the uh, lumen that was initially there has become smaller. So, this hypertensive remodeling of uh, small arteries and arterioles can be a, a potential source of questions for you in your entrance. Again, coming to what happens at the uh, endothelial level, uh, uh, in hypertension, we see that endothelial nitric oxide is impaired. It is also called the endothelium derived relaxation factor or EDRF. So, endothelial nitric oxide is impaired in hypertension. Another thing, if you remember in our earlier sessions, we talked about serotonin. Now, serotonin is actually a uh, 
a vasodilator in perfectly normal healthy vessels, but in hypertension it actually acts as a vasoconstrictor because the endothelium is diseased. It also is a vasoconstrictor in coronary artery disease, but it is also a vasoconstrictor in hypertension as well. Serotonin is a vasodilator only in absolutely normal healthy vessels and healthy endothelium. Now there is something called the intracellular pH or the pH uh, suffix I. So intracellular pH modulates the smooth muscle cell ion transport. There are three types of ion transports, essentially two types, but the second type is subdivided. So, there are three types of ion transports that happen across the smooth muscle cell. One is sodium, uh, sodium uh, hydrogen exchange, which is implicated more in hypertension. Then there is the exchange of bicarb and chloride both are anions. So, anionic exchange, one is sodium dependent, one is sodium independent. So, these are the three types of um, exchanges, uh, anionic and cationic exchanges that happen uh, at the smooth muscle cell uh, depending on the intracellular pH. So, the intracellular pH of the smooth muscle cells are governing this exchange. The second type of the effects of this ion transport are again threefold. Sodium influx increases vascular tone. How? Because as sodium uh, influxes, uh, it also encourages calcium to influx. So, it is not an antipode, it is sodium encouraging, it is like the action potentials that form. When there is, when the uh, threshold is reached, there is influx of calcium from the um, sarcoplasmic reticulum and increased calcium uh, load actually increases contraction and over time it increases hypertrophy. Elevated intracellular pH, again that term intracellular pH increases calcium sensitivity, that is even to small amounts of calcium the contraction and the mitogenic character of the muscle wall increases even with smaller levels of calcium over time. Uh, sodium, sodium hydrogen exchange as mentioned here actually sensitizes the smooth muscle cells to mitogens. Mitogens are nothing but um, signals to increase uh, mitosis or cell division or in other words cell growth. <laughs>